But my system is not based on that at all. It's based on what you do now. Mm -hmm. Behaviors and, and choices and things like that. What's that? Behaviors and choices and things like that. But more than that, it's based in timing mm -hmm. of when a thing, an opportunity or a thought or a, a particular deed is done in the now. Uh, the time gnosis system is based on this. My entire divination system is based on this. Meaning that when I know, say for instance you got a call tomorrow from some big wig, right, mm -hmm. in radio, telling you that they're going to offer you all this wonderful stuff to be doing a radio show, and they're going to syndicate you, and they just love what you're doing, and they're going to give you all this money, and hey, would you even like to have a, you know, a channel of your own, etc. And you're just thinking, oh my God, this is my dream come true. This mm -hmm. is the greatest thing you know I've been waiting for. Fate must be smiling on me. And you plow along, and then six months from now or eight months from now, the whole they rip you off. You're in total debt. You have to sign bankruptcy, and these, these guys, you know, have ruined your life. Right. This is the kind of thing that happens to people all over the world. So what is your normal procedure? Somebody tells you, hey, then don't make a mistake. Go and get a reading. So, yeah, Gary charges off, you know, and runs to somebody to get an astrology reading. And the idea is that this person is not going to predict for you whether the outcome of these opportunities that have been given to you are going to be positive or negative. Right? Isn't that what normally happens? Right. Right. <laughs> okay, this is where, you see, my work fundamentally different, differs. Mm -hmm. In my system, I don't make any future, you know, sort of crystal ball gazing. Not that I'm saying that people can't do that. There are some people who are sufficiently clairvoyant enough who definitely can do that. Mm -hmm. I've had people like that in my own family, and we do know that this kind of ability does exist in a very few exceptional souls who have sort of gifted insight. But, I mean, we're talking, I'm talking here about the rest of the world. Are we all meant to sit back and then go, oh, well, a few gifted people have it. What about me? My system is made for everyone, you see. Everyone can start to understand the mathematical principles that we're talking about here, not just these few rare gifted intuitives in the world. So if you came to me, the first thing I would say to you is, when did that phone ring? Hmm. Just to give you an illustration, I'd say, my God, can you just remember, can you remember even the time that it happened? If you can't remember the time, do you remember the day? If you're failing that, can you remember even the week or, or the month that it happened? And when you give me that information, the true method of divination is to look at when the higher force, your higher spiritual guides or whatever, brought that particular opportunity, event, person, you see, thought into your life. Mm -hmm. The secrets are in that. The secret is in that. And from that, I can give you the whole profile. So it is prediction, but it's in a totally different way. It's dealing with principles of singularity. It's dealing with the true concepts of time, that there is something right. absolutely special about when an idea, a thought, or a person you see, or an opportunity comes into your life. Hmm. And within that seed, within that uh, instant, all the secrets are also given to you if you know how to extrapolate them. There's no question of a tomorrow, because tomorrow does not exist scientifically. Wow. I mean, tomorrow doesn't exist, period. It doesn't exist at all. Right. All that exists is the now. Mm -hmm. Every psychologist of repute, every scientist will tell you there is no such thing as the past, there is no such thing as the future. The trees don't grow tomorrow, they grow now. Your heart doesn't say, well, I'm tired beating now, let me beat tomorrow. Mm -hmm. right? It beats in what is called the eternal now. So the eternal now is the fountain, it's the wellspring, it's the, it's, the, it's the oracle of all knowledge. But divination has strayed away from that. You know, I bring these principles of divination back to the source. So, and this, is, this, this works beyond a treat, because I've had so many people, you know, who've been offered opportunities similar to what I've told you. I've mm -hmm. saved m millionaires, you know, from losing entire businesses. Right. And I'm, I'm not joking you here, I mean, I can't even overstress how powerful this has been from, from personal domestic things and day-to-day -day life to some very, very large-scale uh, things that could have destroyed people's lives. Because you look at this, and as long, and probably the only thing what we teach in our mystery school, is sort of obviously the obvious extension of this, is that, you know, uh, people need to remember the different times and dates that things happen to them. I mean, even down to creative ideas that they have in their brain. They should just write that down on a calendar. Today I had an idea about such and such, or, right. you know, write it down in their diary. But my God, part Absolutely, when it comes to the physical things in your life and the material things in your life, it's absolute suicide not to write that down. That's true. That is the fascinating. world. The world's astrologers and the world's you know so-called diviners, mm -hmm. fortune tellers, don't know anything about this. So they're sitting there, don't even know their own subjects, and are waiting for you to come to them so they can predict and tell you all about it. And no wonder that astrology and these things have got a bad name. It's good that it's got a bad name because that is nothing but fakery and charlatanism. Exactly. Exactly. Very. That is fascinating, Michael, and great information. Extensive work on the year 2012 and there are a lot of people curious about it I mean particularly in the next four years it will take place and I'm quite sure it's becoming a topic discuss 2012 and the parameters and where we're headed and what we can do about it well again that, that comes from the old Maya prediction because the Maya had a lot of different calendars you know uh, and they were very knowledgeable about astronomical and astrological cycles mm -hmm. the thing that intrigued me is you see that uh, is one particular anecdote which ties into the psychological aspect like we mentioned, to me, that's the primary thing. Then when I heard about the Maya talking about that the, the final years of countdown, 
I think one of them was like from 1986. There's a very important countdown to 2012, but you can subdivide that. And then another important cycle becomes at like 1999, et cetera, you know. The next one I think was 19, was 2003. And then the next one of importance was uh, November 8th, 2007, which has just gone by. You know, so there's all these different little markers, if you will, you know, little sub-cycles within the bigger cycle, mm -hmm. which the Maya called their sixth age, the ending of the fifth age and the moving into the sixth age, which really begins in 2012. But one of the most intriguing things that they said is that in the period between the fifth and the sixth age, this is this interim period that started about 1986. Um, I have to look at my notes to be sure, but I'm pretty sure it's 1986 onwards to 2012. That interim period... Mm -hmm which we're in now, they refer to as the age of revealing or the age of apocalypse, you know, or the age of awakening, all of these kinds of terms were used. And that really rang a bell for me because, you know, if you study the esoteric uh, tradition of Christianity, mm -hmm. if you study Gnosticism, you know, uh, the Essenes, all of these different Gnostic Christian groups, they always mention this. I mean, you only have to open the book of Revelation. You don't even have to go to the esoteric tradition. You just go to the normal tradition, and there it is. In the book of Revelation, they talk about the time, you know, of apocalypse. And I, my work always uh, shows that I believe that this reference to apocalypse within the exoteric tradition of Christianity and the age of awakening that the, or the age of revealing that the Maya were talking about is basically the same thing. Right. I just can't see them as being two separate things at all. Uh, for the very reason that the word apocalypse literally mean, meant in Greek, I think, uh, leather covering, like a mask or like the human skin. So with my background in psychology, I suddenly realized, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. This is not so much talking about then physical events. It's talking about something about the psyche of man, that this dark content from within himself, meaning like in the Jungian you know, way of looking at it or the Freudian way of looking at it, behind the mask, literally behind the mask. The apocalypse is nothing more than the revealing of all that content, of all that debris that man has repressed within himself. Hmm. Naturally, the external world will also you know, change as a, as a result of that because consciousness and the world is deeply affected. But the Maya, are there, I believe they're not saying that, no, let's look to external problems first, and then we have changes within the human they were pointing to the fact that human beings are going to go through some sort of cathartic, you know, dark night of the soul, mm -hmm. or some sort of a cycle of awakening. And then, or as a consequence to that, running parallel to that, you will have various uh, reactions in the world. This is what started to get my interest much more, and this is what distinguishes my work, you know, more than the other people who are just saying, oh, sit tight and wait for something X to happen, you know, uh, down the line here in this cycle. I mean, it's just ludicrous. Did you just sit passively by like you're watching a Steven Spielberg spectacular, you know, and then it's all going to happen uh, outside objectively to you? You know, it just doesn't uh, ring true to me at all. And this is sort of like the cop-out New Age, typical New Age, you know, philosophy of just sit back and wait for everything to happen when you don't have to do a damn bit of, you know, house cleaning yourself. Right. So basically then my question started to ask, okay, then what kind of changes, you know? And that, again, opens the door to the whole uh, idea of the shadow personality. And then that opened the door. If people, you know, uh, follow my work on this, you'll, you know, they'll get the idea that then I suddenly realized, well, wait a minute, if they're talking about the rev revealing of dark inner psychic content or working with the shadow, well, then that has an astrological uh, component because that is based on the planets. You see Neptune, Pluto, for instance, Uranus. You see, this brings in the whole age, age of Aquarius right. connection which I believe then also dovetails very strongly with the Christian tradition. Now, Orthodox Christians will go, will not like to hear that because they don't believe that there's anything to do with a tie between Christianity and astrology, but let me assure you there absolutely it, it is. It is, exactly. You're exactly right. You know, we don't have time on, a, on any type of length of a show to, to really go on that, but I have written on it, and there's DVD pr presentations on this. And basically, in short, what then that dovetailed was that, my God, if that is true, then this age of Aquarius and, or age of you know, revealing is certainly mentioned in the Bible mm -hmm. as the changing of the ages, the aeons. We're also talking about the planet Pluto, which I believe connects very strongly with the, um, in the Indian Brahmanistic uh, system, the god Shiva, mm -hmm. and also with the uh, concept of the Holy Spirit that's spoken of in the Bible. Right. So to me, these three things are indistinguishable. It's just a, we're talking in jargon here. You know, these are just a, these are just a, it's just a sort of a, like an alphabet for understanding archetypal ideas. So whether you use the term Shiva or Hearn, you know, or you know, Holy Spirit, let's not just you know get into all of the. Uh, prejudice that that often brings up. People have to understand that this is just a language of archetypal things that's going on. What's important is the archetype, not the stereotypical, you know, kind of biases that people have here. We're talking about something monumental has taken place. It really doesn't matter if you call, you know, a zodiac sign by a hundred different names. Mm -hmm. Because there it is, you know, the sun by any name is the sun. Right. Now, you, you have mentioned in your presentations that all of the clairvoyants that you talk to do not see anything past the year 2012. That's right. Why, why is that? Especially with remote viewers. I'm not saying all of them, but it's been noted. It's noted even before I came to this work that mm -hmm. uh, you know clairvoyants and remote viewers have a difficult time seeing any history or reality beyond the year 2012. I really don't know. I think that 
you know, maybe they're not being permitted to do that. Maybe there's some inhibitor mm-hmm. on there, or maybe there is going to be some sort of radical change within the human sphere. I don't believe the world is going to come to an end or any of that nonsense. Right. And I've always said that. But what I do believe is what we know to be the human world, all those, um, you know, all those uh, symptoms and, and traits that we associate with human world economically, sociologically, militaristically, you see, all of this. And, and, oh, my God, people only really need to take a sincere look at what's happening today, and, and, and this does not seem so far-fetched. Every year that goes by, so many of the mores, you know, and the values and the things that our forefathers took for, you know, to be natural is completely passing by. Right. They you know, so there's not, I have a future DVD coming out in April that's going to get into this whole thing about, uh, you know, are we heading towards a post-human world? Is that what it is? Rather than some sort of spiritual utopia? Mm-hmm. Where, you know, these, uh, these uh, Knights Templars and people who are behind the corridors of power, they're ready to get in, they're going to plug man in. They're pretty, pretty much ready to plug us into the global brain. You know, they've they got plans for us dealing with virtual reality and all sorts of genetic, continuing genetic modifications now that they've been able to restore the uh, technology mm-hmm. that they once used to have in ancient times. That technology has now been restored. So what are we in for? Right. And, and you even mentioned cybernetics, the possibility of being replaced with, with, with cybernetic um, replicas of ourselves. Absolutely. You know what, it's what Steve Quayle calls the genetic Armageddon, you know. Uh, are we going towards this right now? I have a very strong belief that we are. Uh, because I, and, and again, I, I, I rest my case on psychology because, it, it, in me, to me, the equation is very simple. If present human beings, as they are, and I'm including teenagers and children in this, even though maybe they're not doing what they're doing consciously, they're being forced to, mm-hmm. But if the whole human race is, is, has been trained, so expertly trained like a bunch of dolphins, a bunch of monkeys, to be so afraid of, of their own inner emotions, mm-hmm. you know, I mean, polarized, divided within, and they're, they're, they're living in a, such a shallow way, medicated up to the eyeballs, you know, mm-hmm. is, it, is it not possible that when somebody along, comes along tomorrow and goes, listen, we've even worked out that we have a way to completely erase these troublesome emotions, very much like in the way that different movies, you know, uh, uh, I'm thinking of, uh, you know, the movie that was made by uh, George Lucas. Right. You know, I can't remember the name of it right now, THX or whatever yeah, it was. THX 1158 or 1120, I'm close with the numbers, but I know it was 11 in there. Yeah, and then recently the movie Equilibrium, you know, mm-hmm. and so many others, um, you know, in, in which we basically people go, yes, tranquilize me, please. Do it, do it with my, with my uh, own uh, you know, blessing, because I can no longer live in this malaise. I will not go and do the healthy ritualistic work that, you know, uh, helps me to be real and helps me to deal with these emotions. But, but I could but I'll easily take one of your pills that will, you know, help, help it do, and I have the happy drug. You know, and I believe that pretty much you might even see dispensers in the street that this is going to absolutely happen. So then we will enter into this whole new phase, which is the, uh, you know, post-human world. Now, you see, you were talking about the Maya earlier. Mm-hmm. This is where my work differs from the Maya. The Maya weren't necessarily talking about that. And people who study you know, these different predictions about the future tend to have a very rose-colored, you know, uh, way of looking at, oh, we're heading for the new age of Aquarius, oh, we're heading for, you know, utopia, et cetera, et cetera. Now, my work does not approach these subjects in that way. It approaches it in a much more, you know, uh, serious way, saying, well, you know, wait a minute, we, you know, is that the plan that is in the hands of our controllers? The utopia we're, uh, they're talking about might, in fact, be a dystopia. Mm. Yeah, absolute countdown to extinction. The human being may be still walking around. He may be able to perform in pretty much the same way as, you know, you see a, a, these... Uh, Killer whales, some of the most fantastically powerful and beautiful animals in the world, can be taught to do the silliest tricks. The human being is no different. This great soul, this great creature, you know, the human being, having lost his humanity, having lost a deep connection to the things that matter, to his traditions, to his racial background, and to his uh, emotions primarily, his, his positive and negative emotions. Not that the, the negative emotions are bad. They're, they're, they're needed. They're yours. You need to learn how to own them. Right. If or no, this can't happen, and we start living in this pharmacological world, we will be in a very, very short time, you see literally begging Big Brother for that uh, panacea to take away these troublesome uh, emotions and troublesome moods and feelings. Absolutely, I can see that coming. And this is where my work with 2012, you know, uh, comes in. Because I do not uh, look at it positively in that state, you know. I think we have to um, be very wary of what's coming down here because these Knights of Malta and, as I said, the British Crown have Mm -hmm. spawned and the Vatican has spawned a lot of these different organizations, highly technological, highly skilled uh, people that we expose. And, and various think tanks and lots and lots of different clinics and uh, organizations throughout America and the world that they have funded, you see, that are doing this kind of research. Right. And it's, it's pretty pretty frightening when you look at it, you know, what's yeah. coming down. You're listening to the Investigator's Report. I'm Gary Purifor with my special guest, Mr. Michael Tesserion. And Michael, we'll tie into that. But the, this, you did some work on the secrets of time and also discuss your work, which is really more on a scientific level as it pertains to the divination arts of the tarot. Let's talk about that. 
Well, yeah, the sequence of time is based on, I work with numerology, which I believe is a very, very important one of the divination arts. Mm -hmm. But I work with astrology, tarot, and Kabbalah, and numerology, and show, my work is basically showing the deep connections that exist between these four disciplines, so that people who want to learn them can learn them in this, again, synergistic way, like we said, you know, bringing them together as one subject and seeing all these interesting connections. But I always used to think that some of the principles of numerology were, were much more practical on a practical level, and so we sort of worked harder to create a, a, you know, a whole numerological concept that ordinary people who don't have any background in this can benefit, particularly biz people you know, who are in the business world. And so we created Time Gnosis, which is uh, people can go to the Time Gnosis website and check out what we've done there. This particular um, connection that I found between astrology, numerology, you see in the Tarot and the Kabbalah, works really, really well as a sort of a, uh, a guide, mm -hmm. a day-to-day -day guide. Now, of course, we, you know, the uh, system that you're talking about you know, is a broken-down system to make it very simple for people. It's a very user-friendly interface that we created. You know, so you don't have to be like an expert in numerology and all of its, all of its uh, permutations and, and stuff to use. It's just an, a way of breaking down so that people, you know, and if people sign up with this, they get it in their email box every morning. So there it is, your little affirmation for the day and what to look out for. Because I absolutely personally believe, and I remember I've been using this for years of my own life and seeing its accuracy, so that was what gave me the idea, you know, and then the Internet comes along, which makes the perfect way to do this, to, uh, you know, create the uh, databases and algorithms to, to make this incredibly esoteric, actually, uh, system come alive for people, you know, so that they basically know every day they have an understanding of what to look for, what to do, what to empower them with. And what this really does is it turns around the concept of you, instead of being a victim of the day, mm -hmm. of the week, a victim of time, mm -hmm. so that, you know, you don't know what the hell's coming around the corner, right. but in a way you're prepared. You not only may even have an idea of what's coming, but no matter what comes, you're prepared because you already have your statement. You know, you already have your little window of enlightenment and empowerment as to what to do in this particular situation. It's, it's really a, an invaluable situation. And that, 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 that's kind of the difference between how you approach it and how we've been really, you know, either on, a, on a, the other side saying it's evil. You approach it really in a simplistic way and in a scientific way, whereas we're not, like you said, we're not captivated by any theories or projections that are given to us, but we more or less are, are given tools in how to deal with what may happen. And, 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 and more so, I actually believe that some very, very evil people in the world have been using these divination arts. That's why they've got the reputation that they have. The mm -hmm. arts are not any more negative than a paintbrush is negative. Right. But believe me, these, these power brokers in the world, and I mentioned this in the little uh, infomercial that we did for the Time Gnosis system, mm -hmm. you know, I, th that's my passion. That's why I went along with this. In fact, my colleague, the man who did the programming for the system, is a, a high-ranking scientist. He's also an Internet heavyweight. This person comes from the entirely you know, the scientific community, and so does uh, the, the third party who's involved. You know? Both Ellen and Joshua are totally uh, you know, scientifically oriented, but they're smart enough to realize that this, is, this should be approached then scientifically. Number is number. You, the, the subjective connotation you put on it is really ludicrous. And my, my tie-in is to say, yeah, let's work on this because I am sick and tired of the ordinary human being mm -hmm. being mind-controlled to think that these things are devilish or wrong, you see, so right. that they don't use the very tools that the leaders, the people who are manipulating the world, are laughingly using so that they have the kind of empowerment that they have. We've got to turn the tables on this. That's why I'm interested in the occult. My, my interest in the occult is to find out what the enemy has been up to. Mm -hmm. There's nothing negative about the occult itself, but you better know that these uh, demagogues, these uh, sorcerers, you know, have been using the great subjects that once were for the empowerment of the whole race. In the beginning, of, when Christianity was in its inception, it was basically an occult religion, mm -hmm. period. That's true. The leader was hunted throughout the world, Jesus. Mm -hmm. His groups had to meet in underground caverns. They had to use secret symbolism. They were hunted by a despotic empire, namely Rome. Mm -hmm. They were hunted by the, the Jewish synagogues, you see. That's right. Yeah. Tell me what was not occult about the original, you know, Christianity and its inception. In fact, Christ even used to use parables in order to communicate to his people, etc. Mm -hmm. The whole book of Job, the book of Revelation, is in code. There's more numbers in the Bible than there is words. You know, the people, the top scholars in the world have, have even worked to decode some of the various uh, incredible, intricate codes in the Bible. So this is exactly the same thing that I'm talking about. These ancient systems of gematria and numerology are tremendous sacred sciences that people, I don't care if you're coming from what background you come from, they are used to empower you on a, on, on, in your life. But my work is basically to say, yeah, that's fine, but you know, so many of these New Age people have promised all of this, but it's been so airy-fairy, it's been so up in the air, that when you try to work with this stuff, you know, it almost contradicts your, your practical life. It's almost like right. it, 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 it reinforces the divisions between your spiritual you know, life and the practical life. My work with the Divinations Art is to start on the grassroots level and say, let's start here, let's see if they have any use at all in your practical life first, and work from there up into more, you know, personal, private areas of your own life. And we've been successful. That's, we've done that. And numerology is one of the most important ones there because you can literally, you know, do your numbers. I mean, you don't have to have a calendar on your fridge or your wall 
to basically be doing the divination. Whereas with the tarot cards, you know, obviously that does take time to sit down of a day and start doing spreads and stuff like that. A little bit more time consuming, a little bit more energy has to go into it. Uh, so, and the same with astrology, you know, there's a little bit more energy and time, you know, needs to be used. But with the numerology, it's pretty much instant. It's very, very user friendly, and it, that's why we created a separate numerological modality to work with that, you know. Now, you, you mentioned and made a very, very interesting uh, illustration in terms of working with the tarot, working with future events, and kind of offering theories in opposed to mentioning um, prediction. And you made a comparison between offering a prediction rather than, or a theory rather than a prediction. And you made, and how you did that was that you made mention of how a cook prepares a meal. Kind of elaborate on that and how you interface that and how you educate people in regards to the divination arts. Well, one of the most important things that I brought to the table regarding the divination arts is this whole question of prophecy right. and prediction. Mm -hmm. I think that a lot of that is bogus. See, and uh, that basically there's a difference between true divination and, and uh, fortune telling. Right. And I can prove it. Because, and that's why scientists, not only my colleagues with the Timenosis Project, but many other scientists that I know, they really dig what we're doing because it works for them. They can understand mm -hmm. it in scientific terms. It, it harmonizes exactly with the principles that they know that the universe is based on. And because remember, a lot of these scientists who did dabble with these different uh, New Age philosophies got very jaded because they could see it didn't have an ounce of credibility, you know, and rightly so. And when they come across my work, they like it a lot more. And here's the reason. is because I do not believe in prediction and prophecy in the way that has been normally expounded in the world. Mm -hmm. And I believe that um, it's, it's really ridiculous to get into that because then you, you're almost saying that time is determined, you know what I mean? Right. Or, or that fate is determined. Um, sure, a detective knows that a particular criminal is likely to repeat the same type of crime, they mm -hmm. call it profiling, because that person's psychological makeup is, 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 is a certain way. Mm -hmm. And they call that tendency, right? They don't know for sure that the person will right. act in the same way, but you know that there is a law of tendencies. Mm -hmm. So that's one way of looking at it. A lot of prediction is done by good people who go, well, look, I can't tell you maybe exactly what's going to happen, but you, your tendency is to do these three things or right. this amount of things. So if you continue the way you're going and don't change, you know, this is the likely outcome. So that's one way that people get by this thing with prediction. But my system is not based on that at all. It's based on what you do now. Mm -hmm. Behaviors and, and choices and things like that. What's that? The behaviors and choices and things like that. But more than that, it's based in timing mm -hmm. of when a thing, an opportunity or a thought or a, a particular deed is done in the now. Uh, the time gnosis system is based on this. My entire divination system is based on this. Meaning that when I know, say for instance you got a call tomorrow from some big wig, right, mm -hmm. in radio telling you that they're going to offer you all this wonderful stuff to be doing a radio show, and they're going to syndicate you, and they just love what you're doing, and they're going to give you all this money, and hey, would you even like to have a, you know, a channel of your own, etc. And you're just thinking, oh my God, this is my dream come true. This mm -hmm. is the greatest thing you know, I've been waiting for. Fate must be smiling on me. And you plow along, and then six months from now or eight months from now, the whole, they rip you off. You're in total debt. You have to sign bankruptcy, and these, these guys you know, have ruined your life. Right. This is the kind of thing that happens to people all over the world. So what is your normal procedure? Somebody tells you, hey, then don't make a mistake, go and get a reading. So, yeah, Gary charges off, you know, and runs to somebody to get an astrology reading. And the idea is that this person is not going to predict for you whether the outcome of these opportunities that have been given to you are going to be positive or negative, right? Isn't that what normally happens? Right. Right. Okay, <laughs> this is where, you see, my work fundamentally different, differs. Mm -hmm. In my system, I don't make any future, you know, sort of crystal ball gazing. Not that I'm saying that people can't do that. There are some people who are sufficiently clairvoyant enough who definitely can do that. Mm -hmm. I've had people like that in my own family, and we do know that this kind of ability does exist in a very few exceptional souls who have sort of gifted insight. But I mean, we're talking, I'm talking here about the rest of the world. Are we all meant to sit back and then go, oh, well, a few gifted people have it. What about me? My system is made for everyone, you see. Everyone can start to understand the mathematical principles that we're talking about here, not just these few rare gifted intuitives in the world. So if you came to me, the first thing I would say to you is, when did that phone ring? Hmm. Just to give you an illustration, I'd say, my God, can you just remember, can you remember even the time that it happened? If you can't remember the time, do you remember the day? If you're failing that, can you remember even the week or, or the month that it happened? And when you give me that information, the true method of divination is to look at when the higher force, your higher spiritual guides or whatever, brought that particular opportunity, event, person, you see, thought into your life. Mm -hmm. The secrets are in that. The secret is in that. And from that, I can give you the whole profile. So it is prediction, but it's in a totally different way. It's dealing with principles of singularity, it's dealing with the true concepts of time, that there is something right. absolutely special about when an idea, a thought, or a person, you see, or an opportunity comes into your life. Hmm. And within that seed, within that uh, instant, all the secrets are also given to you if you know how to extrapolate them. There's no question of a tomorrow, because tomorrow does not exist scientifically. Wow. I mean, tomorrow doesn't exist 
period. It doesn't exist at all. Right. All that exists is the now. Mm -hmm. Every psychologist of repute, every scientist will tell you there is no such thing as the past, there is no such thing as the future. The trees don't grow tomorrow, they grow now. Your heart doesn't say, well, I'm tired beating now, let me beat tomorrow. Mm -hmm. right? It beats in what is called the eternal now. So the eternal now is the fountain, it's the wellspring, it's the, it's, the, it's the oracle of all knowledge. But divination has strayed away from that. You know, I bring these principles of divination back to the source. 